you often hear people say that boxing is 80% mental. Well, it's impossible to put an accurate percentage on something like that. But the mental aspect of boxing is certainly not to be underestimated or downplayed. It is very, very important in a sport like boxing, which is an individual sport, not a team sport. It's a sport where you're going to get in the ring and be physically assaulted. You're not going to be kicking a ball around. You can't have teammates to hide behind when you're in a boxing ring, the way you can in team sports. So the kind of pressure that you're under in boxing far exceeds the pressure that you're under in a team sport. As I say, particularly with the violent nature of the sport of boxing. Thousands of people watching you in the, re- in the arena, thousands if not millions sometimes watching you around the world on television. So the kind of psychological pressure that you're under is absolutely immense. And it's survival of the fittest. Only the strongest fighters mentally will prevail at the top level in boxing long term. You may have certain fighters who, because of their talent, ascend to the top of boxing, maybe pick up a title. But eventually, under those bright lights in the boxing ring, if you have any chinks in your armour psychologically, you will get found out. It's going to happen. No matter how talented you are, the truth will be revealed about you. Who you really are mentally. So, yeah, the only the very strongest, the people with the highest baseline level of confidence and I've talked about this in videos before that it is my view that confidence is something which is often inherent in an individual something which you're literally born with it's my view that people are born with different baseline levels of confidence and that baseline level of confidence may go up or may go down depending on certain events or certain incidents in your life but eventually unless what you go through is extremely traumatic eventually whatever happens to you your confidence level will return to the baseline level that you have and as I say some people have a higher baseline level of confidence than others David Price is a guy who, in my view, has always had a low baseline level of confidence. At least in the arena of boxing, because this is very specific. Tyson Fury, on the other hand, somebody who was a rival or seen as a rival of David Price long ago. He has a much higher baseline level of confidence. Again, at least in the arena of boxing, there may be areas of Tyson Fury's life where he's not confident but in boxing he has tremendous confidence that's how he was able to get to where he is today by having that high baseline level of confidence and building upon it it was head scratching to me the amount of British boxing fans who criticised Tyson Fury's attitude towards Vladimir Klitschko they were, I don't know, don't know if I, I can use the word disgusted, but they certainly weren't impressed by how nonchalant Tyson was in the build-up to the Klitschko fight. And even before the Klitschko fight, when he was talking about fighting the big names, people like David Hay and so on and so forth. They said, oh, he's arrogant, he's an idiot, he's going to get smashed up and this, that and the other. Little did they know that Tyson Fury's attitude was the very reason that he was able to go on and achieve great things in the sport. Well, I mean by attitude, I'm talking about that confidence level. When he went to 
the Vladimir Klitschko camp long before he fought Klitschko. I believe he was invited there by Manny Stewart. Manny Stewart, I think, was there with Andy Lee, who's Tyson Fury's cousin. And uh, Or maybe Andy Lee brought him in. Anyway, I remember Tyson Fury talking about when he went to the Klitschko camp. And the journalist at the time asked him, were you impressed with what you saw in there with Klitschko? And Tyson Fury said, nope, I wasn't impressed at all, to be honest. I just saw a man with a pair of boxing gloves on. I wasn't impressed. And again, there were British boxing fans saying, what's he talking about? Oh, Vladimir Klitschko would smash him up. It's that very attitude that Tyson Fury had, (laughs) which is why he was able to beat Klitschko. You can't go into a fight with somebody like Klitschko and be all respectful and humble and all that kind of thing. Klitschko will eat you up psychologically. You have to go in there with no respect. You know, you, you obviously know you're going in there with somebody who's got dynamite in his fist and you have to respect that. But in terms of him as a man, no, you don't go in there and bow down to him and, oh, thank you for the opportunity. You don't do that. You have to have supreme belief. You have to believe that you are the superior individual there, the superior fighter, just the superior individual with the superior aura. And that's what Tyson Fury believed. And that, along with his skills and tactics, so on and so forth, is why he was able to lift the title from Vladimir. I say all that to say this. David Price has a lower baseline level of confidence than somebody like Tyson Fury. And his first loss to Tony Thompson came at a point where For somebody, and remember, I've followed David Price since his amateur days, so I saw him capitulate mentally, not just physically, mentally, which is more significant as far as I'm concerned because David Price has always had suspect punch resistance all the way from his amateur days. But when you're a 6'8 heavyweight with tremendous punching power, there are ways to protect that fragile chin and do it successfully. Vladimir Klitschko proved that. But it's much more difficult to protect a fragile mind. Way more difficult. And I noticed that fragility in David Price psychologically from his amateur days. He capitulated against Berman Stavern mentally. He capitulated against Roberto Camarell mentally, not just physically. So by the time he fought Tony Thompson, he was fighting in Liverpool. He had a growing fan base. He had a lot of people patting him on his back. He just knocked out Audley Harrison, so on and so forth. And his confidence level was rising way above that baseline level. But when he got hit with that right hook from Thompson and dropped to the ground, his confidence level dropped all the way back down to that baseline level that inherent level of confidence that he has, which is low. (laughs) It's not as high as the baseline level of confidence of a Tyson Fury, the the, the level that Tyson Fury was born with. So the worst thing that they could have done following that defeat was to sign for a rematch with Tony Thompson, in my view. He don't have the baseline level of confidence to go straight back into an immediate rematch with a guy who just humiliated him in front of all his fans. He don't have it. When you're dealing with a fighter as a manager or promoter, trainer, etc., you need to know the fighter, not just physically. You have to know him psychologically. And you have to make decisions based on how well you know him mentally, not just how well you know him as a fighter in a physical sense. Now, I don't know who was really to blame for putting that rematch together whether it was something that David Price insisted on, whether Frank Maloney and his team wanted to go in a different direction, I don't know. But I do feel, in my view, that it was the worst decision of David Price's career. He needed a long process of rehabilitation. He's not the kind of guy who can just go straight back in and fight somebody again. His baseline level of confidence, not high enough. That should have been known. And the second Thompson defeat compounded 
the psychological scars which he incurred from the first Thompson loss. It pushed his confidence level actually below his baseline level of confidence. But eventually, kind of like a, if you put a rubber ball in a fish tank, push it down to the bottom of the fish tank, the rubber ball will eventually float back up when you let go of it, it will float back up to the surface. Eventually, after a lot of time out, David Price's confidence levels floated back up to the baseline level and maybe a little bit above the baseline level because he had a new trainer under Tommy Brooks, I believe, for a while. And Tommy Brooks was showing him a few things. And he actually had a scare in one of his fights. I believe it was against Parler. I forget the guy's first name. He also fought Derek Chisora where he got dropped more with a, a forearm than an actual fist. But still, he got dropped and he got off the canvas and managed to take Parler out. And coming back from adversity like that, again, would have actually, to some degree, added to his confidence because he already knew that he could be dropped. But he told himself hey, it was a clothesline and it was a, a balance issue more, more than being hurt. And regardless, I was able to get up and finish him off anyway. So I've shown I can come back from adversity. So again, his confidence levels were probably rising again at that point. Then he went in to the Urkan Tepper fight and he was no longer with Tommy Brooks at this point. He was with his original trainer, Franny Smith, I believe, who was also his amateur trainer. And we know what happened in the Urkan Tepper fight. He got wiped out. I think in the first round against Tepa, the ghosts of the Thompson rematch started coming back to haunt him. And this can often happen to many fighters, even fighters who are mentally strong. They can be taken back into that dark place, particularly if the defeat wasn't a particularly, you know, wasn't an especially long time ago. You can be taken back into that dark place in a fight. It can feel like deja vu. And I think that's what it felt like for David Price in that first round against Erkan Tepper because it was a very rough, rough round for him. I think he started feeling like this was the Thompson rematch where Thompson was just on top of David Price relentlessly hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, not leaving him alone. And in the second round, Erkan Tepper closed the show. Knocked David Price nearly out cold. Referee waved it off, counted him out. Now again, he was out of the ring for a long time. And it subsequently emerged that Erkan Tepper was juiced up to the eyeballs in that fight. And that Tony Thompson had also failed a drug test for, I believe, the second David, it was either the first or the second fight, correct me if I'm wrong, one of those fights he filled a drug test for. So David Price used that, as many fighters do, as a psychological pick-me-up. He said, okay, I got beat, I got knocked out, but it was by guys who were juicing. If they weren't juicing, they probably wouldn't have beat me because they wouldn't be able to perform at that level. This is what he told himself. But in the back of his head, he remembers those beatings. He remembers those knockout defeats. Subconsciously, the trauma of those three defeats was still there. And it's a battle in boxing particularly between the conscious and the subconscious. The subconscious is far more difficult to control than the conscious because it's difficult to uh, to even know what's going on in the subconscious of, an, of any individual, not, not just a boxer. To find out what's going on in your subconscious, you have to observe your own behavior over a certain period of time to figure out what the hell's going on in your own subconscious because it's subconscious. It's not, well, if, as the, as the uh, terminology alludes to it's not on a conscious level 
it's operating subconsciously, almost instinctively. So he had these demons lurking in his subconscious, regardless of what he was telling himself on a conscious level about these guys being on performance enhancing drugs, so on and so forth. So last weekend, the Yerkan Tepe, sorry, the Christian Hammer fight took place. And on the surface of things, David Price looked confident again. He'd knocked over a couple of journeymen. He was with a new trainer yet again, Dave Caldwell. He had recently been reminiscing over the time when he knocked out Anthony Joshua in sparring. So his confidence levels, again, at least on a conscious uh, level, were fairly high, relatively high for him. But again, when you don't have a particularly high baseline level of confidence, it's a long way down <laughs> when you've built yourself up. A long way down. Whereas if you're a Tyson Fury and your baseline level of confidence is very high, much higher than the average fighter, and you suffer a bump in the road, like the John McDermott first fight, like the knockdowns he suffered against Nevin Pikage, Steve Cunningham. Yeah, they can dent his confidence. I'm sure they did to a certain extent. But again, just like that rubber ball, eventually it bounces back up to the surface and it bounces back up to Tyson Fury's baseline level of confidence, which is high. It was easier for somebody like him to recover from any mishap. But for David Price, when he built his confidence up above the baseline level, it's a long way down <laughs> and it's a long way back to recovery from a psychological point of view. So anyway, he went into the fight against Christian Hammer and a lot of people are talking about him capitulating mentally. And I think that probably happened. People say that it was psychological as much as physical, the reason why he gassed the way that he did. And certainly his trainer, Dave Caldwell, has been saying that. His trainer, Dave Caldwell, said that David Price was going 12 rounds in sparring at a good pace with different sparring partners, no problem in training camp. But in the actual fight, gas was gone. After a couple of rounds, he was knackered. And to me, it was the residual psychological trauma of the two Thompson fights and the Erkan Tepper fight coming back to haunt him. I mean, you look at the way the Christian Hammer fight played out with him managing to drop Christian Hammer heavily, just like he dropped Tony Thompson heavily in the rematch, only for his opponent to climb up off the floor and put David Price away shortly after. It must have crushed David Price to see Christian Hammer climbing up off the floor and surviving the round and surviving David Price's onslaught in the next round. That's when the anxiety really must have set in for David Price. That's when the deja vu must have really set in. Subconsciously, he knew he'd been in that position before and it didn't end well. If David Price had come through that fight against Christian Hammer and managed to finish the guy off after going through the tough moments that he went through, it might have actually bolstered his confidence. You know, this is the finite nature of being in a situation like that. Because if he'd won, it would have given him confidence to know that actually I can come through a tough fight and prevail. The next time he was in a situation like that, he may have more confidence and maybe wouldn't gas as much as he did. And anxiety really can drain the energy out of you. I remember Andrew Golota was a fighter who they say suffered from anxiety attacks and it would explain some of his bizarre performances during his career. Many other fighters out there, uh, they, they say that Andrew Golota suffered an anxiety attack in the Lennox Lewis fight. For whatever reason, some people are more susceptible to these things than others. And I guess 
in the Christian Hammer fight, David Price, I don't know whether he suffered an anxiety attack, if it was that extreme, but again, I certainly think it was at least the residual effects of the previous defeats that he'd had coming back to haunt him. It was him in the ring returning to his baseline level of confidence, which is not very high. And he was in there with a Christian Hammer who himself was there for the taking on several occasions, who, who himself wasn't in good condition. They talk about David Price being too heavy and that being the reason for him gassing out. Christian Hammer was way out of shape. And he was tired. But well, he still managed to muster the energy to get the job done. When you look at the difference aesthetically between Christian Hammer physically in the David Price fight and Christian Hammer physically in the Tyson Fury fight. He was in way better shape against Tyson Fury. He looked much faster against Tyson Fury and just better all round in the Fury fight than he did against David Price. Against Price, he looked knackered himself, in bad shape. His technique was all over the place. He looked sloppy. But Christian Hammer is a good example because Christian Hammer's been knocked out himself. He got stopped by Fury. He got knocked out badly by Marius Wack. But clearly, his baseline level of confidence was higher than that of David Price. He wasn't thinking about the fact he got knocked out by Marius Wack in a bad way. Even after he got dropped by David Price. He got back up off the floor with the mentality of a hunter, not the mentality of the hunted. And once he recovered, he went after David Price again. So it was a psychological battle in there and Christian Hammer won the psychological battle. <sighs> Can David Price rebound from this? Who knows? I'm not here to say that you know what a man can and can't do can and can't do definitively. I suspect that he can't. But you know you know you never know. I wish him all the best. At the end of the day, when you're talking about a fighter being good enough. You have to not only be talking about physically, you also have to be talking about mentally. It all comes as part of the package. Is this person good enough? Because if you believe that boxing is 80% mental, then you have to be talking about the mindset of the fighter as part of what makes him good. And perhaps David Price, and you know, this is probably the most obvious thing that I'm going to say, is just not good enough to go any further than he's gone. And most of that, yes, may be psychological. But at the same time, he does have physical issues. I don't think he has very good reflexes. Technically, he does certain things which for a big six foot eight guy are very frustrating and I'm not necessarily talking about the jab I'm talking more about his body positioning David Price is a guy who likes to hunch over a lot and square up his shoulders it seems to be like a reflex of his particularly when the fight starts getting rough he'll square up his shoulders and hunch himself over you don't want to do that when you're a big six foot eight guy you just make yourself an easier target for a shorter opponent. You want to stay side on as much as possible. And certainly don't hunch over. <laughs> You're presenting a much more available target. So he does certain things from a technical point of view, which still haven't been corrected. His reflexes are poor. As far as his weight, you know, it's very heavy. 200 and God knows however many pounds, 20 stone or whatever he weighed against Christian Hammer. Um, but regardless of all that, the biggest problem is his mental weakness. 
that's always going to be his biggest problem. Maybe he should go and see a sports psychologist. I mean, I don't know how effective these sports psychologists are. Some, I'm sure, are more effective than others. Some people are probably more receptive to the methods of these sports psychologists than other fighters are. So I don't know how effective it could be, but I would certainly say that at this point in David Price's career, it's worth trying. I don't know if he's seen a sports psychologist before, but it might be time to go back or go to a different one or go to the one that's very highly recommended. I'm not sure. But if he wants to pursue this boxing thing and continue, because he's still relatively young for a heavyweight, if he wants to pursue it, he wants to continue, then needs to get his mind straight. And also, he's going to need a very long rehabilitation period. All this throwing him back in, in tough fights. You know, here's the thing with David Price. Everybody knows he's vulnerable. In terms of punch resistance and his mindset. So he's going to need a very long rehabilitation process where he's just fed journeyman after journeyman after journeyman for a long time before he's actually ready to step up and fight somebody who's going to hit him back with any kind of real intent. And that may be frustrating for people watching him, but in my view, that's what he needs. When Mike Tyson, and most professionals, but I'm going to use Mike Tyson as an example. When he first turned professional, he was fed a steady stream of extremely low level opposition through the early part of his career. People he was blasting out for fun. I mean, you look at the state of some of these people he was fighting. They look like they've been dragged out of the crowd. And you ask, what benefit does Mike Tyson get from blasting out these kind of people? They're confidence boosters. That's what they are. And I guess his team felt that he needed those confidence boosters. Maybe more than some other fighters needed. Mike Tyson was somebody who certainly had a higher level of self-confidence than the David Price, but he certainly didn't have a higher baseline level of self-confidence than somebody like an Evander Holyfield. Definitely not. So they fed him all these, as they say in the United States, tomato cans. When George Foreman came back after a 10-year hiatus to the boxing ring, following his defeat to Jimmy Young in the 70s, or was it the early 80s? I think it was the 70s. He also fought a terrible level of opposition, but I think that was less to do with George Foreman's confidence and more to do with the fact that he was you know, pushing 40 and it would have been suicide to throw him in with somebody competent uh, after a 10-year layoff without going for a certain process first of uh, getting his feet wet and <clears throat> taking very small incremental steps back to championship level. And yeah, George Foreman fought an absolute who's who of the journeyman circuit in the United States before they put him anywhere near anyone who was remotely world level. And in my view, that's the kind of rehabilitation that David Price is going to need if he decides to continue in boxing. An extremely long run of knocking over journeyman. <laughs> He's going to need that to build up his confidence, to build up the confidence that he has in his power and to also sort out his technique. I said this about Anthony Joshua a long time ago when people were criticizing his level of opposition. If I was managing a fighter, I wouldn't want to move the fighter on to a high level of opposition until he was doing things from a technical point of view to my satisfaction. If he was still like David Price, hunching himself over, not staying side on, not maximizing his reach, so on and so forth if he was still doing those kind of things as David Price was if you saw his fight against Zavarotny a fight that he won you'll see those same things that he was doing 
If that was my fighter, I would have kept him at that level until I rectified those issues. And people can scream and shout and criticize and say, oh, he's fighting bombs. I don't care. I know what I'm looking for in my fighter. And until I see those problems rectified, he's not even moving up in competition. He's going to keep on knocking over these journeymen. And if these issues are not being rectified, we're bringing in a different trainer. Have to rectify these technical issues at the very least. And while we're rectifying these technical issues, he's building up confidence because he is knocking over people. He is knocking people out, so on and so forth. And I would definitely put him in with guys who are physically durable, but not very ambitious. So, anyway, this is a long meandering video. I'm sure a lot of you probably switched off a long time ago. <laughs> well, you're not here to hear me say that. But for those of you who stuck with it, big up. And just in closing, if David Price decides not to continue his boxing career, I think he has a very viable career, in my opinion, as a boxing analyst. I think he's good. At, uh, you know, being a commentator and, and as a boxing analyst, as a pundit, I've been impressed with him. So I think that's definitely a possible field he could go into if he chooses to, or if he wants to take a break from boxing. He seems like a smart switched on guy to me. I'm sure there are many other ventures business-wise he could go into and be successful. Certainly not the end of the world. He's got a family. He's made a decent amount of money from boxing, I'm assuming. It's all relative, but I believe he's been well paid for some of his fights. So, you know, it's uh, certainly not the end of the world. It might feel like it for David Price in the short term, but in the long term, in the grand scheme of things, you know, he's got plenty, as an outsider looking in, he's got plenty to live for, plenty to be happy about. And uh, he has a future if he decides not to pursue professional boxing as his, as his career. He's got a future as a pundit. You know, many other fighters have done that. So, yeah. Let me know what you think about everything I talked about in this very, very long meandering video. Hopefully you appreciate it. All right. It's Hatman. I'm out.